I'm Nate Silver, and my book is called The Signal and the Noise. So the title of the book comes from electrical engineering, where the signal was like the sound that you want to hear. So maybe on the radio, the Yankees game or Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. Um, and the noise is the crackling from all the other radio stations that interfere with your signal, kind of interfere with the truth of the sound that, uh, the high fidelity sound that you want to hear. And we found these terms were coming up again and again in other fields that we looked at. Um, financial people refer to noise traders, or people who just kind of make trades based on bad information. They add volatility and randomness and not um, any real pattern to the system. Um, when you talk about detecting terrorist signals amid noisy chatter, that's totally irrelevant to what you're trying to find. So this metaphor kept coming up so much, we made it the title of the book. Um, and people are looking to distinguish the signal from the noise, but we also found that you really need to appreciate both. If you're trying too hard to find a signal, then you'll kind of trip out on all the random patterns in the data. We have visual cortexes that want to perceive information and make it meaningful, even when we know that um, sometimes there's a lot of information that doesn't really mean very much. One reason why baseball has made so much progress is because you play 162 games per year in baseball. There's, it's easy to learn from your mistakes. You will make a lot of mistakes when you're trying to evaluate how baseball players do, but it's competitive. You learn from them and you learn quickly because you play games every day. There's a season every year. In politics, if you have a stupidly designed model or a loose assumption or, or kind of a viewpoint of the world that's detached from the reality, you're only going to learn that once every four years at a time, and it takes a long time to, to actually get better. Sometimes computers have a certain mystique that I think can potentially be, be harmful for, for forecasters. The idea being that, oh, this computer possesses intelligence and it'll, it'll solve problems on its own when you give it enough data. And that's a little bit dangerous. Computers run programs that human beings design. They have a lot of advantages relative to what we can do. They're, they're very fast. They don't get emotional or tired. Um, so there are a lot of uh, tasks that computers, like any other type of machine, can be very helpful with. But even in weather forecasting, where they use supercomputers and very well-designed programs, um, the human forecasters still perceive things that, that computers don't. Um, where knowing the weather in a certain local area, where you might know the geography a little bit better than the computer, understanding things like, like the structure of a system, our vision is way better than computer vision is right now. So we can look at a, at a hurricane system or tropical storm in the Gulf of Mexico and say, is that storm well organized? Is something cohering from that storm or is it kind of flying apart? A computer doesn't, doesn't always see that big picture. You know, the average pundit goes up on TV and doesn't really know what they're talking about, frankly. The journalists do. The journalists who actually go and gather information that's very useful. But if you actually look at how accurate pundit predictions are, and we did that in the book, they're literally no better than than flipping a coin. They're just there to entertain you, but we shouldn't pretend that they have any real insight or knowledge about the way the political system works.